Hello, Claudia. Hello, Ann. Hello, Mark. Well, hello, everybody. Um, back again on Thursday. There was a lot of questions that were asked. Um, always very good. I'm very appreciative of them. Um, several of you had asked the questions of um, perilines and pyrroles. So I thought I would go, go over those a little bit. Um, we have four pyrroles. And let me show you what those look like. So we have pyrrole crimson. Pyrrole crimson. Pyrrole red. Pyrrole scarlet. Hello, Claudia. I'm really good. Thank you. And pyrrole orange. So those are the four pyrroles that we have. And then there was also a question about the, the perilines. So we have violet. Perilene scarlet. Perilene red. Maroon. Hello, Thomas. Normally I'd be singing in Fabriano. And then uh, Paraline Green. So kind of what's the difference in the pyrroles and the Paralines? They're both synthetics. Um, they're both very, very beautiful series of colors. Um, the pyrroles are more opaque, so they're more opaque um, or semi-opaque than the perilines. The pyrroles actually make a, a much cleaner mix than the perilines. The perilines are transparent to semi-transparent and they can have an undertone of brown. For example, certainly the, the Paraline Maroon. So that's the main difference. They're both high performance pigments. They're both very beautiful pigments. Um, the pyrroles tend to be a cleaner mixing color um, than the perilines because the perilines have that undertone associated with them. Hello, Tess. Okay. Um, one of the other questions that was asked was about the watercolor grounds. So I thought we'd go over some of the watercolor grounds. Um, one of the questions that was, uh, that I wanted to answer was tinting. You can actually tint the buff or the titanium white uh, with watercolor or with acrylic. Um, with watercolor, you don't want to use more than 10% of a watercolor when tinting, or you'll change the characteristics and the absorbency of the watercolor ground. You can almost go to 20% in acrylic. So the, the, the watercolor ground is tintable. Hello, Linda. Um, the thickness that you want to lay down is about the size, of the width of a dime. Um, about one mil is the thickness that you want to lay down. And if you do that thickness of one mil, a four ounce bottle will give you about 20 square feet. Hello, Angela. Um, so a four ounce bottle will do about 20 square feet at one mil thick. That, that's a lot of space. Um, and essentially anything you put it on has just become a watercolor substrate. The time it takes, it takes about 24 hours for the watercolor ground to, um, to dry. Uh, yeah, and you wanna let it dry. You don't wanna use a, a, um, a blow dryer or a heat gun because you'll, you'll uh, um, mess with the polymer of that, of that particular product. So you want it to naturally dry. And 24 hours, 
that usually is about what it takes. For um, a sealer to protect it, you can use a um, MSA with UV absorber. Best way, however, is to put it under conservation glass. Uh, Soto probably won't be till um, maybe November. Um, right now, the governor hasn't said when we can open up the stores except for curbside service. Um, thinking about the, the watercolor ground is one bottle, you can decide whether um, you're going to make it rough or smooth. So you're kind of in command of how and what you want that to look like, which makes it uh, very interesting. Hello, Scott. So one of the questions, hello, Rick. One of the questions was, um, when do I use black watercolor paper or black um, ground? Black watercolor paper, you would never use the, the black ground on a black watercolor paper. Um, Again, for about the same price, not much, not a whole lot different. Um, a four ounce black ground will do 20 square feet, which is many, 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 many pieces of black watercolor paper. Um, although black watercolor paper is actually quite beautiful. So I hope that answers some of the questions you may have had on ground. If not, please let me know and um, I will go and answer them fur further. Another question was on uh, the Mayan colors, and I will show you some of the Mayan colors. So we have um, Mayan dark blue. We have Mayan orange. We have Mayan red. Mayan violet, Mayan yellow, and the Primatech, which is the Mayan blue genuine. A lot of granulation happening here. So the only one that, and the reason we call the Mayan blue genuine a Primatech is because it's the same methodology that the Mayans used to make this color, which has lasted um, all this time and that is they uh, infuse indigo into clay and there's a process of heating etc that locks that in and locks that pigment um, for a huge amount of time hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and still maintains the same light fastness so it's a it's an excellent pigment that has a um, historic basis to it whereas the other Mayans that we have do not have a historic basis. That's why this one's a Primatech and these are not. Good morning, Caroline. Okay. The other question was about the phthalo. So this is some of the phthalos. Phthalo blue turquoise, one of our newest colors. Phthalo blue. Thalo Green, and this is Blue Shade. Thalo Green, Yellow Shade. Thalo Turquoise. I love the mines too. Hello, Stella. Thalo Yellow Green. and phthalo blue. The interesting thing about the phthalos is that they're very transparent. Um, they're also very clean in mixes. So that's one of their characteristics. Um, with the, the red and the blue, you can also, by using a, a cobalt blue, get to a violet, and it's a, it's a more pure violet. Or you can use the green shade or the blue and get, to get a green shade, you can mix it with a Quin Rose or um, a Perlene Red. So that's why we have the two different colors. 
Um, okay. Then there was a series of questions that were asked. They were really good questions. So thank you. Um, so James asked how many coats to get to one mil thick. So you would, James, you would do the one mil thick and then you would let it dry. And it, it really what, what it depends on is um, whether the material you're, 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 you're coating over is porous or non-porous. So if you're going over a piece of canvas, um, you may have to use more than one coat. If you're going over a piece of plexi, then you're not gonna to have to use more than one coat. But again, uh, if you wanna do something where you wanna build um, uh, some type of a, um, design, which you can do, then uh, you might wanna make it a little bit thicker. And it's kind of really good to use a, a foam brush. A foam brush works really, really, really good. So let me go over some of the questions that you asked. And, and as I look over here, um, I will also answer the questions. So ultramarine and French ultramarine, do they granulate differentially? They granulate roughly about the same because as you remember, they're both PB29, both exactly the same pigment. Um, just because one's a little bit bigger and, and, and you're talking, you know, four microns to nine, nine microns, um, uh, they, they are about the same in, in granulation. Uh, buh, 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 buh. George, Georgia asks, uh, will we give examples of colors that are opposites? Yes, when we get the, um, the color sphere working, we'll have that. Um, but there may be a maybe maybe a way to add that to the spreadsheet. So let me let me think about that. The answer is yes, but it won't be until on the sphere. It won't be to the end of this year, the beginning of next year, because it's actually quite complicated to make it interactive, where um, you can put a, a color and then have its opposite. It's just it's it's not that easy. Hasn't been that easy for, for me or for us. For, um, for others, it may be very simple. Do you have any idea when you'll be resupplying the internet, internet suppliers? So our product, uh, we're all dealing with the COVID-19. Uh, many of our, uh, many companies are shut down. Um, we have shipped to distributors and then it's the time for distributors then to, to ship to stores and stores in the U.S. and around the world are just starting to, to come back. So um, uh, the product is out there and it's just the time period for it to go from distribution to the, to the, to the retail market. And hopefully that'll be very soon because um, many of you have been asking that. And thank you for using our product. Would your, uh, this is Janet and Janet asks, would your pigments we don't make egg tempera, but they should. But we no, we no longer sell pigment as well. At one time we did. Um, Debbie Cleveland, this probably comes from the last, uh, one of the last sessions. Um, and it was, how much water is too much water to add to watercolor paint? Um, and what I had talked about, if you add too much water, and you'd have to add quite a bit of water, you can actually rip the gum arabic away from the particle and that would be counter doing everything that we do to be able to make the paint. Because as you remember, we use the three roll mill to get the gum arabic around each particle um, as a binder to, in our process of making the paint. And that could be undone by adding too much water. But you'd have to add a lot of water to make that happen. So I wouldn't be all that concerned. And it's, it, it's a watercolor, so really you should play with water. Many times what I find is, um, uh, when I watch anyway, uh, people don't use enough water. And watercolor is really, the, one of the beautiful things about watercolor is wetting it out. Um, that's where you get the vibrancy, that's where you get the beauty. Because when it's in mass tone, it isn't all that beautiful. Um, this is from Lalitha. And she has chromium green oxide is opaque. Still, it has excellent light fastness. Um, so 
chromium green oxide is an oxide, and in general, um, all oxides have great light fastness because all oxides, for the most part, are um, of the earth. So they would have great light fastness. However, it, opaqueness and light fastness are not the same. They're different characteristics. So you have staining, you have light fastness, um, uh, you have its opacity, and those are, those are different characteristics. So light fastness is simply how long the paint um, will, will stay in sunlight. Uh, and the majority of ours are 100 plus years. Opacity is whether something is transparent, semi-transparent, or opaque, and that's really whether you can um, glaze or layer, etc. So different characteristics that you would think about in terms of doing your paintings. One of the other questions was, well, how does a paint become light fastness? And that's all due to the particle and the chemistry uh, behind how that particle was created. Okay. So I was asked by um, Laylitha again uh, about putting a uh, product on Instagram. Yes, we've been late putting uh, the videos to Instagram. There's a lot on Instagram. Um, but yes, I will start putting the videos onto Instagram. Hello, Roberto from Italy. It's great to see your, your name there. Hello, Joanne. Um, so what are some of the main characteristics of a Primatech color? The main characteristics of the Primatech colors are their light fastness, because because they're natural, they're high light fastness, um, and also their granulation. They granulate really, really, really well. And that's one of the major beauties about them. Uh, this is Laylitha. I'd love to hear about Rose Matter Genuine. So there was more than one question asked about using um, vegetable material for paints. And there was a lot of things used in history. There were insects, so you have certain beetles. Um, you have mollusks that made um, certain purples. Um, rose matter is the rose matter root. Um, those are all fugitive because realistically what they are is their dyes. And um, dyes are never permanent. There's always a half-life on a dye, and it's usually about 20 years. So while you can make colors out of many things, they won't be, um, they won't have a high light fastness. And you're giving up other things as well. Um, the, some of the modern pigments, the majority of the modern pigments are, are highly vibrant, um, and they're very clean, and you don't get that from a dye. So while you can do that, um, not optimum for not optimum for having your paint last or your painting last. Um, Julie asks about uh, the thing that helps you make your roll up your tube of paint. Julie, you can find those at your local art store. You can find those on the internet, Amazon, and it's just it's just called a tube roller, and you can get them in plastic, quite inexpensive, or aluminum. Um, they're actually quite inexpensive and they do a good job in rolling up the tube for you. Um, Julie also asks, uh, when you get pigments from the automobile companies, do they, do they then process, do we then process it to achieve a finer grain? Um, as you know, we've gone over before, the majority of the colors that come from the automobile industry um, are made for solvent, and then so we have to chemically modify them. Uh, so they can wet within a, um, a watercolor matrix. And if you've watched, if you've watched on uh, the video and you saw the three roll mill, there's one image of it with um, orange paint and there's one image of it with um, imperial purple. It's the three roll mill. And what that's doing, it's not only deaerating the product, but it's, it's taking the agglomerate, it's taking those um, particles and it's separating them out so that gum arabic can go around each particle. That machine can be set to different, um, different widths, and those widths correspond to um, microns. In fact, you saw another, another item within those videos called a, a grind gauge, and it's where the chemist took some paint and he 
he went down with what looked like a ruler. It's actually a grind gauge. And we look for a grind gauge of about six. And six is about um, 14 to 20 microns. 14 to 20 microns. So it's really, really, really small. And that machine can change the micron level of any, any pigment. So what we're looking for, and it's a really, it's a great question, Julie, um, is to get the best optimum uh, refraction um, index so we get the most amount of light coming back off of a color. It's a very complex question. It's a very, very, very good question. So most excellent question. Um, so Corbin uh, asked about, he has a Mars black ground. Uh, what are some paints that work? So any of the luminescence will work really, really well with it, Corbin. Um, they'll really, really pop. Um, as will some of the whites. Titanium will pop. It's a white. And the buff titanium will pop. So those are things you can to really pop those colors. Um, Mel, Mel asks a really good question. Mel asks, um, can you use granites and marbles to make? <coughs> um, not really. They're used in the tile industry, etc., cetera, to, to repair tiles. Um, but in the paint industry, what would happen if you ground those down? They would just look like white powder. They'd look like flour. Uh, because there's not enough crystal within them to give you the refraction of the color. So... Um, they wouldn't work well. Uh, hello, Lauren. Uh, if you haven't done so, Lauren has a great video in the artist studio where he talks about paper. He talks about uh, brushes, how to load brushes, unload brushes. Uh, I believe he talks about the way that he creates his blacks. Uh, it's a phenomenal story of how he takes the time to create his own black um, before he does his paintings. It's a, it's a great video to watch. He's a, he's a very, uh, he's a great artist and, and just an extremely nice man. So, great video. Um, what do I mean by fugitive when I talk fugitive? Um, so you have several different um, uh, levels for a fugitive color. You have one, which means it's not fugitive. That's for us, that's 100 plus years. Um, it can be a two, that means it's 100 years. And we test that with the xenon phadometer. I put an image of that um, on the website so you can actually see what that looks like. Um, and then you have three and four, and four is fugitive. Um, we only have two colors that are fugitive. Um, we have the uh, opera pink and the alizarin crimson. Alizarin crimson is a cold hard derivative. It was used by the masters sell it as a permanent and then you have opera pink which is a fluorescent all fluorescents are fugitive so fugitive means it's not going to last in full sunlight it will start to lose its vibrancy um, and it will start to to lose um, you'll see it actually start to disappear so i don't know carolyn i've never I've never added a marble dust to see what it would do. That, that'd be that'd be probably pretty interesting. I'm sure, Joy. What's what's meant by blossom and diffusion? So let me look into that further. So I can give you back a, a, a quick answer. I will look at that. I believe you asked that before. So I'm gonna make sure I write your name down and I will reply back to you in in the feed. Okay, um, so Joanna answered the question between the pyrroles and the perilines. If you weren't online to hear that, let me know in the feed and I will write it as a, um, a message back to you. It was a great, great question. So are there any colors not made from um, stones? Well, Eva, there's a lot of, lot of colors not made from so that's that would be minerals. Um, so our Primatex series, which are minerals, and that's because they're crystals. Um, there's a lot of siennas um, and umbers that come from rivers, for example. 
Um, and then there's the whole world of synthetics. And that's uh, uh, different um, structures being put together within the, the chemistry to create, to create phenomenal colors. And you see that every day. Um, every car that you see out on the road is a synthetic. So uh, they wouldn't use umbers, they wouldn't use Primatex because that would be a granulating car and they would call that a massive recall. So those are all part, those are all high performance pigments and we're surrounded by those, which is, uh, it's a beautiful time to be around because they're just gorgeous. Um, Best pigment to watercolor we talked about. Another um, artist asked about, uh, asked about ox gall or gall. So ox gall um, came from cattle. It was um, a natural product that was mixed with alcohol to create ox gall. And what ox gall is, it's a flow release. Um, we do not use ox gall. Ox gall is not in any of our formulations. Um, it is... Uh, it is, in my opinion, not a good thing to add to a watercolor. If your watercolor is in flow, um, so while it's available, we do not use it. Um, it's not something that you'd want to use to rehydrate a paint. You don't want to use distilled water, but that's essentially what it is. It's a, it's a flow releaser. If you see ours, when ours has dry, because we use it, if the paint is very, very dry and you touch it with uh, a water it's going to go into solution just almost instantaneously there's there's no reason for for the ox skull how big of a mineral is needed to make a 15 tube of color well about the softball size of lapis would make um, about four tubes of paint so it takes a lot of mineral because that mineral has to be purified um, the impurities have to be removed we do that in many different ways. We can do that by um, putting it within a, um, an oil matrix, and then different things having different densities will go to at different levels, and we'll just take off the level that we want over and over and over, and that's a way to purify it. And then there's, there's many other ways to purify. So in general, Giovanni asked a question, what is the micron level of the powder that we saw last week? Um, it, it's about, it, it can be anywhere from, from two microns or a one micron. One micron would be a um, lunar black, is about one micron. Two to three microns would be an ultramarine. Five to seven would be a French. But the rest, for the most part, are around 14 microns, 14 to 20 microns. And that depends on the grind that we're looking for because of the refraction index that we want to have to give the, the, the best um, color saturation. So when you saw that drawdown the chemist was using, we're on the chief chemist. Um, we're looking for a six and a half grind. It's on that machine. And that's a 15 to 18 micron level. Luminescence would actually vary from that. Luminescence, uh, because they're made of, it's almost like a sandwich of, of metals and micas, etc. to be able to give those, uh, that luminescence, whether it's a, um, a duochrome, an iridescent, an interference, or a pearlescent, um, it would destroy it if we went down to 15 to 18 microns. So those we keep up about 60 microns. Um, that's why it's really important for the chemist to test every batch because if you process, you can't use your eyes. You can't, you, the human eye cannot see 12 microns. Um, it's so, so small. So it's, it's the, the mills are computerized and you still have to test to make sure you're where you wanna be you can always go from a higher micron to a lower micron, but you can't go from a lower micron to a higher micron. So if you over-process your batch, you've ruined it. So that's why it takes a lot of um, consistency in having it tested, uh, moving slowly, so that you're always where you wanna be. Um, do we have watercolor artists that work for Daniel Smith? Um, when I had my call center, 
Um, everybody that worked in the call center was, was an artist, but they were all types of artists. They were oil, acrylic, uh, litho, or ink printmaking. Um, in the manufacturing, there's probably three people that use watercolors. Um, probably 80% have played with them as I play with color, just laying it on a piece of paper and watching the interplay between the different colors. Okay, I think that was all of your questions. I have some here. Oh, well, thank you, Helen. So Helen's been, uh, we've been her source for 20, 25 years. That's, that's phenomenal. I've been here for 31 years, so um, almost all, all of my time. Oh, fantastic. Hello, Carolyn from the UK. Yeah, it's so Carolyn, if your tube has 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 dried, <clears throat> essentially what you have is a pan in the shape of a tube. So you can undo the saddle crimp, the crimp in the back, just undo it, and then open it up a little bit and add drop by drop of distilled water and just use your breath to your brush to get whatever amount of paint that you want to get. Um, you could also slice it open and cut it in pieces, and those pieces would be kind of like a pan. Um, no different than if you took the watercolor itself and squirted it into a half pan or full pan. So it's still very, very usable. It'll re-wet very, very quickly. Um, it's just now in a different shape. I would not suggest, I would not suggest that you use Oxcol, which is a flow releaser, um, not not good to use. And you don't use, need to use gum arabic. The gum arabic is already there. So distilled water is your is the best way to do it. Yeah, most of the staff that works inside of the Seattle store are artists. Um, they love talking to other artists. They love probably as much, maybe maybe even a little bit more, talking to people that are just venturing into art. They're, they're very caring, very giving people, the employees, the staff, um, and they love to help. They genuinely love to help. So they're, they're truly wonderful people. Water cycle painting medium in proportions and layers. So, Carol, let me get back to you on that. I, I actually have that written down, so I will send that to you. So you're talking water-soluble oil painting medium. I will get back to you on that. I will send something to you. So have you had time to actually look at some of the videos and did those provoke any questions that you have? I'm gonna be sending more. Um, I just need to be able to get back into the into the manufacturing area. And usually, that's it's it's best done when um, nobody's there, so I can take my time. You know, I don't know. So Laurel asks, "Can you use watercolor? Can you use cold wax as a sealer?" I don't know. I couldn't see why you couldn't. Um, I don't know what that would do. So let me think about that, Laurel. Let me get back to you. Um, you can always try on a very small, a very small um, piece of work that you do. You can do a play work um, and try it. Uh, I don't know if the hot or the the wax when you pour it on. Um, when you use the uh, MSA, it's alcohol solvent based, so it doesn't re wet. It doesn't re-wet your watercolor. You don't want to use anything that can accidentally re-wet your watercolor, um, which is going to be on top of your ground. So let me think about that. So even though we don't make anything from... Um, 
So organic, so we have organic and organic and inorganic pigments, and those are just whether they have carbon or don't have carbon, whether they're a metal or a carbon. So if we take that away and say, do we make anything from um, plant-based, um, et cetera, um, the answer to that is gonna be no. Um, coffee that you have um, is gonna be fugitive. So I, I know some people use them, and I think that's the wonderful thing about being an artist is that that creativity of wanting to try new things, I, I embrace that. Um, they're gonna be fugitive, so um, you just have to decide if that's something, it doesn't do you any harm to play with. When I tell my chemists, kind of a, a, kind of a similar, similar, similar issue, I tell my chemists, inside the laboratory, I want you to have all the fun you wanna have. Because if you have fun and you make something which is fun, the artists that uh, buy at Daniel Smith are gonna have fun. And really the end result is, are we having fun? Um, so you may wanna play with the coffee grounds, et cetera, to have fun, and then, then you just decide when you're gonna to sell to somebody that you would have to tell them that it's fugitive. Um, I think that's always important. It's really why we put those um, characteristics on our watercolor chart so that you can share with people. I'll give you a small story. I have a, um, an, an acquaintance I met. He lives in um, Australia, and he did phenomenal paintings, phenomenal paintings, uh, beautiful paintings. And one of the colors that um, he used, un unknowingly to him, um, was fugitive. Well, all of a sudden, these paintings that you've done, that you said, wow, these are my masterpieces, um, if they're hung up in uh, bright light, start to, the, the color starts to go away. And so I think there's a, you always wanna be able to have fun, but you wanna also see about what the, the long view is. Okay, so Carolyn's used um, cold wax polish to seal watercolors. I've never done that, so very interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Carolyn. Laura McCracken says, there are several wax products that are made for sealing watercolors. Um, thank you, Lauren, thank you for sharing that. If you could uh, maybe let us know, that'd be fantastic. So that those are both good information. So Carolyn has a um, demonstration on the Daniel Smith blog, excellent. Love Norway. So um, my, uh, the president of JDCI, which is the distribution arm of Daniel Smith, um, is Norwegian. So we had just uh, visited Norway last year. Um, it was beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautiful country. Had a, had a fantastic time. Ooh, Stella, that's really, so Stella uh, had a 25 year old uh, painting using lizard crimson and it's long gone. Wow. So uh, people ask me, John, why do you carry a lizard crimson if it's fugitive? And it's because uh, many people, for example, Stella professors are extremely knowledgeable about paint and many of them want to paint like the masters have done and they will use that, but they'll use it knowingly that they know it's fugitive, but they want to do something in the same way the masters have done it. And so that's why it actually sells uh, really, really, really well. We also make a permanent version. So if you like that color, but what a permanent version, we do have a permanent version. No, the, uh, the replacement is actually a series of a couple of pigments, Helen. And you can see it on our watercolor chart. If you don't have a watercolor chart, um, it's actually on the new spreadsheet that we just put up, but I will also um, get back to you and tell you what the two pigments are. I don't have my, um, actually, I will look that up and send that to you so you have that. I rub Dolan's wax on my watercolor. Wow, very interesting. Interesting. So Linda bought a painting 
that has totally disappeared. That's it's it's really um, I think about that all the time. All the all the paintings, watercolors I have in my house, um, and my my um, my etchings I have behind conservation glass, um, just because I I really enjoy my artwork and I don't want to have it disappear. So now Sally just uses permanent. Yep, I, I think that's a it's a great way to switch. So Giovanni, we test we test the uh, the, the paint out for a um, hundred plus years. So we use that, and I posted an image of it, the xenon fadeometer. And in four days, the Xenon Fidometer can do 100 plus years. And you know, that's going to, thank you, Agnes, that's going to increase if you then have it behind conservation glass. That will increase if you don't have it in direct sunlight. Um, all those things will add on the amount of years. One of the other questions I get asked quite a bit that this provokes a little bit is if I take something that has 100 plus years and I take opera that has say 25 years and I add those together and it's 125 years and I divide that by two and it's 62 point something years. It, it doesn't really work like that. Um, fugitive is fugitive. And so even though you, you may be mixing it with um, high performance, um, uh, high light fastness colors, you're only gonna increase the fugitive color by five to six years. Um, so fugitive is fugitive is fugitive. It's that's just the nature of the beast. Yes. So Joy, um, you can use UV spray, and uh, that that works. Um, always good to test it in a corner to see it, if it's alcohol based or solvent based. It shouldn't bleed, but it's always best to test it just to make sure. Okay, well, I want to thank you all very much. Um, I appreciate that you're spending uh, a part of your um, Thursday with me. I love your questions. Uh, total from the last two, I had just under 500 um, comments. I love the questions. Um, please share those with me and I will get back to you. I try to share, many of the questions are just so good. I want to spend time and share it with you. I did want to show you one thing before I leave. And it was... Um, This is something Raffaele asked about, and this is Viridator. So sometimes as a blue, it's a very pretty blue, uh, Viridator. So he had talked about that at last session, just wanted to show you. Yeah, they'll, you know, it'll disappear if it's in bright sunlight, but I, I think you also should play. Thank you all very, very much. It was, it was good to have you. I wish you, um, health and safety, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you all. Bye-bye.